Welcome to Unbiased on the Fence. I'm Shane. Thank you guys so much for joining. This is a very special video. In this uh, video, I'm going to be sharing some transcripts from a recent Beyond Quantum healing session. And uh, the uh, client has chosen to remain anonymous because of their you know, profession or whatever. And it was just uh, the portion that wasn't personal. And I do appreciate them for allowing me to share this information because it has really tied in with a, I had a bunch of synchronicities with this session. As a matter of fact, the day before someone, uh, before the session, someone had uh, talked to me about the Cabbage Patch Babies as a Mandela effect. And uh, of course, I thought they were talking about the dolls when I first heard about the Cabbage Patch Babies. But then I realized there's something else entirely different going on with the Cabbage Patch Babies and these weird post postcards. And uh, this is going to tie into um, a lot of the other things we see. But the day before, when someone was asking me about the Cabbage Patch Baby postcards, and strange art you see, and I'm going to give you guys some examples of all this in a moment in case you haven't heard of it or whatever, but I had that weird feeling about it, and I thought the first thought in my mind was, you know what, it has that same strange feeling I get about it when I look at art that was generated by artificial intelligence. So the very next day I have the session, and that is confirmed in the session, so I want to remind you guys, this is going to be more apparent in the quality of information that comes through here as just how, how important it is to realize that where two or three are gathered, of course, that's a Mandela effect. Some people remember it as two or more are gathered. But when two or three are gathered, there shall I be also, speaking of Christ. And I think, uh, you know, when we get into the energy and the thoughts and the power we have to create our own reality that's going to come out in this and just how much we're in control. We're going to see how much that when two people come together and uh, what I typically think of as like, you know, kind of coming out of the randomness, it's not random at all. But when thoughts pop in your head out of nowhere, an idea, these things come from the divine. And when two people gather together and they're discussing things, the divine leaks through more and more. That's actually one of the reasons why I started, uh, I was doing beyond quantum healing sessions, but decided to do these hour long uh, perspective chats because intuition, uh, so many times, even during a beyond quantum healing session, in the beginning part, while we're just talking, so many wonderful things can come through um, when you're connecting with someone of a similar high vibration. So that's the whole reason why I created the um the perspective one hour chat. So if you want any information on that, you can go to my website at, uh, I started to give you the iMac address, <laughs> uotf.net. And then you can click on the contact uh, tab and get information about the sessions I offer and contact me directly. But you'll see just how uh, Beyond Quantum Healing has just changed my life as a practitioner. And I want to encourage you guys, I actually have a link down in the description where you can take the lesson and get um, get a discount on it. And it has, besides the Mandela Effect, which the Mandela Effect led me to the Beyond, Beyond Quantum Healing and Dolores Cannon and all of that uh, wonderful work. Um, and it's showed up in my star chart as well. I don't know if you guys know uh, Lori Lothian, the uh, lunatic astrology. Um, she's awesome, really knows her stuff, but she uh, found that hypno popped up right in my star chart right around the time that I started getting into this. So it, literally, this has been written in the stars for me, and I, I'm just so amazed at all of it. So if you feel that passion, that drive to, you know, as I'm talking about this, you're like, you know, or if you listen to this and you want to experience something like this from the other side as a practitioner, Check that out in the link below, and you can uh, sign up and take the course all online. You can do sessions all online, and we're coming up on Christmas as well, so that's a great opportunity to offer sessions uh, to people, which people I'm noticing are way more receptive now as we're moving forward, and so many amazing things are happening. So many people are recognizing and seeing the synchronicities happening. So I want to get right into this because I was blown away. 
because I had this feeling that some of the art that we see is actually generated by AI. So let me pull this image up here. This is actually um, a, uh, a work of art that's created. It's an AI work of art, and it actually won uh, first place at the digital category, in the digital category, at the Colorado State Fair. So this is Jason Allen's AI-generated work of art that won and, uh, of course, people were upset about it. But if we look at it, you can see that you get these, uh, if you look really close, nothing makes sense. I mean, it looks, the colors look good, everything looks good, until you really start looking at the details. And you're like, wait, which way is this person facing? How many arms does this person really have? And this person back here that looks like they're on a cell phone uh, at a glance. But, you know, the deeper you look into it, and of course, you know, you guys might be on the phone, so you don't notice it. I've got a few other examples because hands are really something that's super difficult for AI. So you can see some of the weird stuff you get when AI tries to generate hands. And here's another one. So when I, um, when I started looking into the Cabbage Patch stuff, I started feeling like uh, it had... The same feeling you get with this, just kind of creepy and unhuman, like, you know, uh, in the way that it's created. Of course, it looks real. It's realistic, but there's just something off about it. You know, of course, too many fingers. That's one problem. But anyway, it's just the feeling that comes along with it. So, uh, so we're going to talk about Cabbage Patch babies, but not the dolls. Of course, we knew about this trend that went around in the 80s. And this before just recently was the only Cabbage Patch dolls or cabbage patch babies I knew about were these dolls here. But what we're actually talking about is some weird, strange, I don't know, like Photoshop before it's time, these strange postcards with cabbage patch babies. Look at this. Have you guys seen any of this? So this is going to come up in today's session along with a, a few other things. Here's another interesting picture. Um... And uh, somebody wrote a book about it. I didn't read the book, but I thought this here on Amazon kind of summarized it pretty well. It says, where do babies come from? According to hundreds of early 1900s postcards, they hail from cabbage patches. Far from being just an 80s doll craze, the idea of cabbage patch babies has its roots that span centuries. These aren't just quirky artworks. They're early precursors to the surrealism movement, and they hint at a darker, less known history. Embark on, an, on a captivating journey, and I guess this guy like goes over some of the postcards you see um, that were distributed across Europe and United States. So there's actually a book about it, but you know, he uh, actually, he says, by delving into the lesser known histories like the orphan trains and founding hospitals and even tapping into ancient references. Okay, so that led me to another connecting thing here. And, of course, it's the orphan trains, which is fairly new for me. Uh, yeah, a lot of this stuff is new. So you can look at this really strange artwork. And um, another thing that's going to be coming up in the session is incubator babies. Have you heard of them? Uh, here's a little, uh, a little snippet here. Uh, this comes from... This website, this website here is tourists strolling along the Coney Island boardwalk in the summertime circa 1920 would have heard the barkers beckoning. Don't forget to see the babies. Those that he heeded the call, perhaps after enjoying a, enjoying a hot dog or a ride on the cyclone, paid a quarter and stepped into a room where the tiniest of infants weighing two or three pounds each were on display in individual incubators. Uh, Madam Raked, uh, this nurse, occasionally wild the crowds with a special trick, placing her diamond ring around a baby's wrist. So yeah, incubators are gonna incubator babies are gonna come up. Uh, uh, like I've heard of like you know preemies being in these sort of incubator sort of things, but not way back in this time period. Uh, another topic that's gonna come up is Tartaria. Now, all of these, um, 
I actually looked into separately. I didn't spend a whole lot of time with it. I just didn't have the interest. I kind of like looked at the mud floods. I looked at the Tartaria stuff. I looked uh, just very briefly at these orphan trains and all this stuff. I just really didn't have the desire to look into it. And now I kind of see why. I think um, a lot of times we're guided away from things or we just don't have interest in things that might be a waste of time. So I found this TikTok video here and it kind of summarizes Tartaria and the mud flood. So if you haven't heard of it, here's a quick little summary. The Tartaria mud flood theory is a controversial hypothesis that suggests a catastrophic event took place in the 18th or 19th century, resulting in a massive flood of mud that covered entire cities and wiped out entire civilizations. According to this theory, the civilization of Tartary, which was once a powerful empire that covered a large part of the Eurasian continent, was destroyed by this event, and its existence was deliberately erased from history by the ruling elite. One of the main pieces of evidence cited by proponents of the Tartaria mud flood theory is the presence of mysterious buildings and structures in various parts of the world that seem to be older than the officially recognized timeline of human history. These structures, known as megaliths, are often made of large stone blocks that would have been impossible to move and erect using the technology available at the time they were supposedly built. Another piece of evidence cited by proponents of the Tartaria mud flood theory is the strange architectural features found in many old buildings in Europe and elsewhere. These features, such as strange windows and doorways, seem to have no practical purpose and are unlike anything found in modern architecture. Proponents of the theory argue that these features are remnants of an older civilization that was destroyed by the mud flood. There are also claims that the Tartaria mud flood theory is supported by geological evidence. Some researchers have pointed to the presence of sedimentary layers in certain regions of the world that seem to indicate a massive flood event took place at some point in the past. Other researchers have claimed that the soil samples from various parts of the world contain high levels of unusual substances, such as iridium, that are typically associated with meteor impacts or other catastrophic events. Proponents of the Tartaria mud flood theory argue that the mainstream scientific community has ignored or deliberately suppressed this evidence in order to maintain the status quo and avoid acknowledging the possibility that there may have been an advanced civilization that was wiped out by a natural disaster. They also argue that the ruling elite have deliberately erased the memory of Tartary from history in order to maintain their own power and control over the population. Okay, so that is actually a pretty good summary of Tartaria and the uh, mud flood theory. You can look into all of this more if you want. And this is also going to tie into um, actually a lot of people that look into Tartaria and the mud flood. So say this ties in directly to um, what we know as the world fairs. Have you guys heard about the world fairs? I actually had a world fair in St. Louis in 19, in the early 1900s. And I had never heard of it growing up there. So are these Mandela effects? Are they something else? Let's take a look at um, a little segment here of the World Fairs. And just in case you haven't heard anything about it. Right as this sort of period ends of unbelievable strangeness, and all of a sudden these fairs spring up all over the world with impossible buildings. Buildings we're talking about, which are colossal structures. Chicago built 700 acres of fair in supposedly less than two years. St. Louis built 1,200 acres of exposition buildings. One of the buildings in Chicago, the manufacturer's building, would house 300,000 people. There's a giant statue in the middle of the lagoon. It was called the Golden Lady, and it was known as the Statue of the Republic. It was 65 feet tall. They say it was covered in gold leaves that had copper underneath, but others speculate it was actually made out of solid gold. So you're talking 65 foot high, potentially solid gold statue. We're talking giant structures and looking like ancient Rome with towers and domes and columns and the most fine ornate pieces to them in these record unbelievable times. Then as soon as they're done, chuck them in the garden. They had a canal system that ran through the entire exposition. They also had an above ground electric train, an electric train. Well, where's the electricity coming from? That's running around the park. They had a moving walkway down by the shore. Not enough people are asking, where does this technology come from? It was certainly more than all of the lights anyway that were in New York City at the time were at the Chicago Exposition. Yeah, it must have been mind-blowing for most of those people 
who had only seen gaslight or candlelight at night to see that city lit up in such a way. Again, count the ways, 1901, we are told, whether it's true or not, the idea of being able to electrically do anything hasn't been around that long. And this fair is bizarre. This is supposed to be Tesla's fair, where he managed to somehow move electricity from Niagara Falls to Buffalo for the fair. No one's really explained how he actually did that. Uh, and at the middle of the fair is a 395 foot high electrical tower on top of which of course is a female golden statue called the goddess of light that this thing was lit up by some suggest half a million electric light bulbs again when you look at the photos of this thing it's just where do they really get the power from i mean think of what it would take today if you had a place with no electricity and no way to pipe it in the generators that would have to be built for example, there's a building that went up for the Barcelona Exposition in 1888. It was claimed to be the fastest built building in the world, 5,000 square meters, capacity for 2,000 guests, 600 rooms, 30 apartments, and it was supposed to be built in 53 days. This is supposed to be a time of horse and buggy. The two-year building times are actually important. All right, so that's enough of that. So that will give you kind of a, an overview of some of the things we're going to talk about, just enough for you to understand if you hadn't heard anything about any of this stuff before, because for a lot of people, this is brand new. And uh, But it's really exciting to hear how it came through. I'm excited to get this video over to Christopher Anatra. I think, you know, with his work with time travel and things like that, this might be, uh, this might be something that he uh, can use in... His research. So let's just get right into this because I am really excited to get into the actual session. Sorry, I had to take 17 minutes to set this up, but this was super important because, and you'll see why, because if you hadn't heard about some of this stuff, this might not make a lot of sense. So let's get right to it. What can you tell me about the Cabbage Patch Babies? Cabbage Patch Babies. This is an AI insertion into this reality. It keeps people distracted from finding the spiritual self. It's still real. Situations and lives are created around it that people could experience if they went there astrally or after death. The babies grew up, had lives, and have all moved on. They would have been considered NPC type people because they were inserted. There are also other NPC people here now that are a result of other AI inserted stories that haven't even been told yet. That is how there's NPCs. Wow, the creation of NPCs. Now, can these NBC NPCs be taken over by real souls at some point, like as in walk-ins? A walk-in can go into any living conscious being but they arrange it ahead of time. So would this be the, A the Matrix AI or the man-made AI, both or one manipulating the other? The Matrix am I. The Matrix AI is natural. Right, so it's not AI in the way we think of human AI. Right. Can the natural Matrix be hacked by the unman un or, sorry by the man-made ai if it's allowed so if it's part of the overall script yes and if a soul allows it that's how you have some people that deal with demonic things while other people don't have that experience at all okay so the human ai can manipulate a conscious being which is connected to the natural matrix and can affect it? Is that the chain of events? Yes, it can affect it, but it's still the being's choice to interact with it. So the human AI gains access to the natural matrix through a person, right? Right, and the, per and the people can say things to other people and not even realize it. It's like one big antenna and two big intelligences natural, and technological. How are these insertions happening? From the technological side's artificial intelligence. There can be inserts from a long time ago that show up now in our reality or from the future time, and it shows up now. So 
This is done with a computer or something like that? It is. But just like in the way the natural matrix is manifested by your thoughts, feelings, and emotions, the technological matrix, the technological artificial matrix, manifests through things like magic and computers. Let's use the AI insertion of the Cabbage Patch Baby story as an example to help us understand how this all manifests. AI creates the story and puts it out there, making it look as if it really happened. How is the natural matrix triggered to create things to support the story, like all the babies? In this story, these ba babies basically were showing up out of nowhere all over the place. There's some truth to the idea people had that they were just grown, like in a cabbage patch, because they seemed to be everywhere. This all goes along with the story that Earth was reset and had to be repopulated. These stories have become a reality because of the manifestation ability of the technological AI. Everything is possible, whether it's natural or technological. What the story is put therefore, is to distract people from their spiritual journey now and create a bunch of NPC-like beings, but some ended up being real beings. The real beings, were they walk-ins or were they born with a soul naturally? They were all walk-ins, but to be blunt about it, a lot are walk-ins when they come here, even when walking in for the first time as a baby. But if they walk out and someone else walks in, it is contracted ahead of time, before the first walk-in. Right, so they're not like empty cars anyone can just hop in and drive away in. It's all controlled like needing the car keys. Right, and, it just, and just like when people are born, they may be around the mother before the baby's born, checking out the family and deciding if it's the family they want. Some people have pre-birth memories of this. And then they walk in and live that life out. And then later on, if there's another choice to exit, another walk-in can come in and take over that life. And this is mutually agreed upon on a higher level, both by both souls. Nothing is forced. Are the mud, flood, and Tartaria stories also connected with this Cabbage Patch story that's been inserted into our reality by AI. It stems from it. What about other stories? Are there any other conspiracies connected with all of this that we haven't talked about yet? Yes, things connected with world fairs and incubators. Understand someone can go into this and access it, live it out and experience it, and they're creating it as they go. Does that make sense? Kind of like seek and you shall find? Yes. Kind of like if you follow an NPC home, you will see they have a house and a family waiting there that may not have been there until you went and looked and it was created? Yes, you put it well. So when you see these world fairs with these enormous structures that have been built in record time and then tore them down, it was basically really created and destroyed on a computer? Yes, it really works like a computer. It's putting it into our, re our natural realm like an overlay, but it still feels like matter. Now, I just uh, missed how deep this line actually was. I want to read it again because uh, this actually tied in with some of Gosha's work real early on, uh, Gosha from Cosmic Agency on YouTube, uh, about us actually living in 5D, but just having like this 3D overlay of things. So uh, that took me back to, to that discussion. So I really wanted to read this one more time. Yes, it really works like a computer. It's putting it into our natural realm like an overlay, but it still feels like matter. So when we see these other changes in history, like the Black Tom attack on America by Germany that damaged the torch on the Statue of Liberty, are these also part of this negative insertion? Are they separate, or how would you categorize all of it? Well, it's really interesting because each insertion can have multiple purposes, and other purposes can be even be created as they are discovered. For instance, 
If there's someone who studied the Statue of Liberty a lot, they may find synchronicity and magic in things connected with the Statue of Liberty. A negative realm insertion can still be positive if someone chooses to be positive, chooses it to be positive. It sounds unbelievable, but it's true. In fact, when someone true chooses to create a positive outcome from a negative realm insertion, it now becomes an option for other people who would have only seen and defaulted to the negative option before its creation. Or they could create an entirely different positive or negative outcome from it all, right? Yes, that's how it all works. Are we going to experience a split in consciousness, a dividing of the people into two realities so we can have more growth potential and continue to expand? At first, it will seem like everybody's just the same, but positivity will increase and chaos will decrease, but others will still experience the things the media pumps out. None of this will affect those on what you would call the shift side. It will barely even be a thing. You can see it happening now already. The media talking about more lockdowns and masking up again. And while it has ha already become a reality for some people, you aren't experiencing that within your reality and those people aren't in your reality. So the split's already happening then. Will it be sort of like the Mandela effect where it seems like all the chaos just goes away as if it as if it's always been that way that's exactly what the mandela effect is it's from consciousness splitting yes dividing and it can split in a lot of directions so you want to focus on positive changes you can make it be good or bad it's like a cell dividing and dividing there are many mansions many realms and many realities and what you know but don't think about is that there are aspects of you in all of them. So you are kind of just wherever you focus. So it's better to focus on the reality with more positivity and less entropy. So we really are guiding our own ship of experience, so to speak. Yes, everything you say, think, and do. Can you provide any insight into why some people are experiencing a lull right now, downtime. Is this some sort of calm before the so storm, so to speak? If you go on a bridge where there have been a lot of people with fear and anxiety crossing the bridge, you can run into the residual energy of that. Understand there are many thoughts, feelings, events, and memories that are really just swirling around. Sometimes there can be a concentration of the swirling energy like a big weather system, but it can also be small areas where you walk into it and all of a sudden you feel angry for a few moments. You may think, I have nothing to be angry about right now. Why do I want to punch you in the face all of a sudden? Ha, ah, right. And then it will pass because it, really, it wasn't really you. It was someone else's res residue of thinking about punching someone. So a thought form is created by, some, by one person, and then another person sort of just walks into it. Yes, exactly. Let's go back to the larger swirling energy cloud you described as being like a weather system of thoughts, emotions, memories, and so forth. Is AI or some other technology being used to add to or to manipulate the swirling thought energy? Yes, they try, and they do, but that will only directly affect the people that have had the V juice. And I had to change that up a little bit, but you can figure that one out. And it actually worked on them. So whoever had the V juice and it actually worked on them. Since many will naturally fight this off, others are helped in many other ways to neutralize its effects. So that's one of the intended mechanisms of the V juice then to make people more receptive to some of the technological influences they're putting out there? Yes, right. And there's technological and there are natural waveforms like that. Every person is different as well. Like if you expose the world to strep throat, for instance, there would be a whole range of responses from nothing at all to serious sickness that could lead to death. 
Some would have natural immunity, while another may have built-up immunity, and so on. You never know. Everyone reacts differently to everything. And it's also important on what they're focusing on in their thoughts. So when we talk about natural ways this cloud of thought energy is affected, you mentioned our positive and negative thinking affects it. Would this also include things like music, movies that affect our thinking as well, which affects this cloud? Yes, it's created by emotions and thoughts. So if you watch a scary movie, for instance, and those feelings of fear are allowed to continue and continue, they can turn into a thought form and show up in your reality. There's many ways thoughts can be created. Even 5G waves that make you feel a certain way that makes you think a certain way. This cloud is self-sustaining from the physical and emotional response to it. It's going to happen more and more because there's always more being created. But we can evolve beyond that, where we have a high vibe day even though it may be extremely challenging, like skipping through puddles where you can acknowledge something and not be affected by it. Whether it's caused by someone else or an experience, whether it's natural or technological, you have the level of of awareness to recognize that it's not you and you just learn to move on from it faster. Are we in danger of the man-made AI destroying the natural realm, the, the natural matrix realm? If that's what you believe, a place will be created for you to experience that. <laughs> that's pretty interesting because right here, just let you know, it's, it's the person that saw that that experiences that, not everyone. So that's pretty, that's pretty good because I, te- I definitely don't see the overall reality being affected at all. I see it all as working together like cogs in a machine. All right, so we'll move on to the very last one here, I believe. What the most important message you can share with us, the collective right now, where we are in this overall process? Answer, there are a lot of people with good intentions and a lot of routes you can go down for information. Everyone has another perspective. It's almost better to not watch all those things because it causes you to maybe latch on to little things that you don't even realize you subconsciously brought into your reality, and it grows. Other people's perspectives that make you doubt your very own experiences or put a fearful spin on them, and so on. For the reasons stated earlier in this conversation, you can see how these negative ideas of others can affect your own reality if allowed to grow within your creative thought energy. So how about that? That was uh, pretty mind-blowing. I just had to share it with you guys. Lots of love, light, and unity. Check the uh, description box for links. See you in the next one. Peace. Mm -hmm.